Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Suzanne Goldberg, Executive Vice President for University Life at Columbia University, and I really could not be more delighted and excited to welcome you here tonight for this very special evening. This is a historic event as we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and as we celebrate Eleanor Roosevelt, who is chair of the United Nations Human Rights Commission, was really, as everybody here knows, the driving force behind the Universal Declaration. We're also proud this year to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School, where I'm also on the faculty. So. I'm so glad to see so many students and faculty and staff from the law school, from around our great university, and from the human rights community with us. And I am honored to extend a very special welcome to Columbia and recognition of the family members of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and President Franklin D. Roosevelt, including great-grandchildren, Laura and Frank Roosevelt. Grandchildren. Uh, excuse me, grandchildren. I don't know where they're, well, they're, they're great and they're grandchildren. Um, uh, Frank's wife, Grace, and I believe, is Phoebe here? And Phoebe and their daughter, Phoebe Roosevelt. So really just thrilled to, to welcome you all here. Uh, I also want to recognize Alice Hartman Hinkin, who among many other accomplishments served for three decades as the director of the Justice and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. Alice has long been part of the Columbia Law School family, having been married to, for many years to our cherished colleague, Lu, the late Professor Lewis Hankin, who founded the human, Columbia Law School Human Rights Institute 20 years ago. So among their many connections, yes, we can clap again for that, that's good. <laughs> Among their many connections to this evening's celebration, Alice and Lou Hankin received in 2010 the Eleanor Roosevelt Award from Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton for their work in human rights. I want to thank also the co-sponsors for this evening's event, Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute, Columbia's Master of Bioethics Program, our Institute of, for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia, and uh, my office, Columbia's Office of University Life. I also want to thank the student organizations that have helped to support the evening's event, uh, including RightsLink, the Columbia Society of International Law, and the Columbia Human Rights Law Review. So thank you very much to all of the students who have helped out for the evening. We have a wonderful program and a fantastic panel ahead, so I will be brief and just share a few opening words. You know, as I think everybody in this room is painfully aware we have a long way to go when we think about our vision for the world of human rights that we would like to see. And so what is, a, what is our job? Our job, I, as I think of it, is to bear witness and at the same time to think, to strategize, and to act in ways large and small to, it, that continue to make the Universal Declaration of Human Rights not only an aspirational visionary document that it is, but also a reality on the ground. Indeed, when, even when efforts to secure and protect human rights are so starkly challenged as they are in our world today, uh, we have a responsibility also to recognize the substantial strides we've made. And partly in the vision of, I, I wouldn't say in the shadow of, really in the, um, what's it called, the, the golden rays of the Universal Declaration, we have seen and we continue to see a marked increase in access to medical services and quality health care, a decrease in infant mortality, nearly a billion people who have been lifted out of extreme poverty, and the increased representation of underrepresented minorities, religious minorities, racial and ethnic minorities, and LGBTQ minorities. That said, we live in a challenging world and our work to secure and protect human rights will never be done. But really, thanks to Eleanor Roosevelt's visionary work, we have a human rights system to turn to, to give voice, to hear, to bear witness, and to make important decisions about uh, to recognize violations of human rights. I do want to share something personal, uh, because I actually think about Eleanor Roosevelt's work in creating the Universal Declaration every day. And you may wonder why. Um, and the reason is that on, in my apartment, hanging on the wall, I have a first 
day of issue stamped envelope with a postmark from the United Nations dated December 10th, 1958. The special stamp commemorates the 10th anniversary of Human Rights Day and Eleanor Roosevelt's signature, so your grandmother's signature is on my, hanging on my wall. Um, and uh, and what I also love, in addition to, to, to that part of the, the envelope, is that there's a photo, the great photo, it's the one that's on the poster for this event. It's Eleanor Roosevelt holding the Universal Declaration. And I, you know, it's, it's like holding something even larger than the New York Times, or at least the, how the New York Times used to be, right? It's a big document. And the look on her face to me, she's looking at it, it's serious, I think, and realistic about the challenges ahead that were then and that are now still deeply embedded in our world. And at the same time, it is a look of promise, it's a look of hope in great, and great pride at the, in the Declaration's vision and in the Declaration's commitments. I think in that photo, you can see her faith in future generations, including so many colleagues, so many students and colleagues at Columbia University and beyond, and her faith in us that we will continue to do the work that we must do to achieve greater human rights in the world. So it is now my pleasure to invite Robert Klitzman, Professor, Robert Klitzman, Professor of Psychiatry and Director of Columbia's Master's in Bioethics Program to join you. He has been instrumental in bringing this beautiful tribute to Eleanor Roosevelt to our community. Again, thank you all for being here tonight on behalf of Columbia. We're really thrilled to celebrate the evening and look forward to the discussion ahead. Well, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you to all the organizers, and thank you all for coming here, and thank you to those of you who are joining us online. This is being live streamed. I'm delighted to help welcome you to this extraordinary event. Uh, several months ago, I learned that in celebration of the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the granddaughter of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Laura Roosevelt, uh, uh, since Eleanor had spearheaded the declaration, uh, had uh, uh, Laura and Bill Shipsey from Art for Amnesty were arranging to place a handful of busts of Mrs. Roosevelt in a handful of key meaningful locations around the world. One was in the Netherlands, in the town where the Roosevelts came from before coming to the United States, for instance. Uh, one was in a war-torn region in uh, uh, Central Eastern Europe. And I asked them whether there was going to be a bus placed in the United States. And they said, well, they'd like to, but they haven't found a place yet. So I immediately suggested that Columbia University would be an ideal location uh, for such a bust, uh, and they thought that was a great idea. Um, fortunately, uh, there also was, uh, were Paul and Caroline Cronson, uh, and it's through their generosity, through the Evelyn J. Sharp Foundation, uh, that this has all become possible. Uh, I thought Columbia would be an appropriate place because many of us here at Columbia, not just in the law school, but in many other schools and departments, including the College of Physicians and Surgeons, the Mailman School of Public Health, the Masters of Bioethics Program, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, the School of Professional Studies, and many others, uh, think that human rights is very important to the work that we do every day. Both in the U.S. and other countries, human rights have played a major role in health care in bringing life-saving medical treatment to millions of underserved people around the world who otherwise would not receive it. These crucial applications of human rights principles uh, help people living with HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, people who are dealing with opioid addiction, depression, and a myriad of other disorders and problems. We who work in this, these areas are deeply honored and grateful to be part of this amazing celebration today. I want to thank the law school again for hosting this event and also for providing a place for the bust. Uh, the Cronsons, of course, I want to thank the organizers, Maya, et cetera, and others uh, who have made uh, this presentation of this timeless reminder of a timeless woman who had a timeless idea and one that I think will, in these ways, uh, stay here with us for many years to come. And now it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce the 15th Dean of Columbia Law School, Jillian Lester. 
She is also the Lucy G. Moses Professor of Law here. She needs no introduction here, but for those who don't know, she has written widely uh, in many, many areas of law uh, and uh, has been involved with the Legal Aid Society and many other organizations, and uh, we are immensely grateful to you for hosting this event tonight. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you very much, Bob, for that introduction, and I'll, I'll, I will join the chorus of thanks to all, all uh, the myriad uh, faculty, students, organizations, uh, uh, members of other parts of campus who came together to make this event such a wonderful event. And of course, all of you who came to be part of this conversation, I thank you as well for joining us and, and participating in this important evening. Um, and this is an important evening. Uh, we come together in the spirit of reflection to consider the significance of a document that codified the rights of individuals around the world and awakened our global consciousness to the role each nation must play in safeguarding human dignity. We also gather to pay tribute to the woman for whom this declaration was a paramount achievement. Uh, the substance of tonight's program will um, we'll talk uh, a great deal more about the Universal Declara Declaration of Human Rights and and its effects on the global order over the past 70 years. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, the way in which we view the world today, both uh, the achievements we celebrate and the horrors uh, we call to light, is framed by, uh, is really benchmarked against the Declaration's 30 historic articles. Uh, here at Columbia, uh, this is a, a very important uh, a document, a very important uh, historical uh, uh, artifact that lives on. Uh, members of our community helped to shape the Declaration at the time of its passage and continue to lead human rights research, education, and advocacy around the world. Our Human Rights Institute, uh, which is led by uh, Professors Sarah Cleveland and Sarah Nucky, uh, is celebrating, as, it's, as was mentioned, its 20th anniversary this year, uh, and together with the renowned Human Rights Clinic, uh, the Institute really is a hub uh, for the study of international human rights uh, and trains a new generation of human rights practitioners and advocates very proudly, sends the next generations into this important um, and meaningful uh, and vital work. Uh, law students can also, here at Columbia, join human rights-focused organizations, uh, pursue internships, at human rights NGOs and edit the Columbia Human Rights Law Review, which in the, in the spirit of celebration of anniversaries here uh, today, I should note, is turning 50 this year. So um, I take uh, enormous pride, just enormous pride, in the ways that human rights education has permeated the law school and advances uh, uh, and advanced really the, the principles enshrined in the Declaration. And, and I consider human rights education truly to be at the core of our mission here at Columbia Law School. Uh, the late Professor Lewis Hankin, founder of the Law School's Human Rights Institute and a pioneer in establishing the legal framework for international human rights law, saw a clear path from the Declaration to a more just world. He cited the decline of colonialism and communism in Europe and Asia and the rise of democracy in places like South Africa as living examples of the world having been influenced by the Universal Declaration. Still today, this same framework moors the turbulent vessel of moral progress and provides a star chart of sorts to help navigate us through darkened and unsteady seas. Uh, the progress that Lewis Hankin cited was exactly the kind of change that the Declaration's uh, primary shepherd, Eleanor Roosevelt, hoped to see in the world. The Declaration, of course, was her crowning achievement, and the document and the human rights system that it spawned has no doubt withstood the test of time. Eleanor Roosevelt awakened the collective conscience in uh, the world, uh, in the United States as well as the world, uh, and the world's leaders through uh, her efforts to pass the Declaration, but perhaps even more than that, she was an example of the kind of change that can be brought about uh, through hard work and dedication to a cause. And here I'll, 
echo some of, um, of the words of, of, of Suzanne Goldberg, uh, who spoke earlier. Um, uh, in 1951, just a few short years after the ratification of the Universal Declaration, and with the legacy of World War II still seared in the minds of citizens, Eleanor Roosevelt told the American people on a radio broadcast, it isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it, and it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. So uh, Suzanne, maybe it's having Eleanor Roosevelt on your wall that has you echo echoing that philosophy as you think about um, the work we all do together at the university to advance uh, this important cause. And still today, of course, we take inspiration from Mrs. Roosevelt's dedication to hard work and definitive action uh, to embrace our choices as indicators of our values. So it is with great pleasure and with a deep sense of responsibility uh, that we honor Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt's legacy and contributions by accepting a bust that will be displayed here at Columbia Law School. Uh, the creation of a bust is among the highest forms of recognition. Uh, it's, it's an image of the person in, in its full dimensions. Uh, in its full dimensionality. Uh, and I am so proud that Ele Eleanor Roosevelt's bust will be the first bust of a woman here in Columbia Law School. Uh, it'll serve as an endearing reminder that uh, of Mrs. Roosevelt and her myriad contributions and the key role she played in, in codifying the set of rights that lay a foundation of a universal code of dignity, of respect, and of common humanity. I'd like to invite Laura Roosevelt, granddaughter of, of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, and Professor Sarah Cleveland, uh, to join me here at the front of the room as we uh, unveil the bust. We are supposed to lift it up, yes. <laughs> We've been given very precise instructions as to how to lift the veil. <laughs> I'm not touching it. You're not touching it. You and I. Right. You and I together. Come on that side so we can see. Okay. You. Okay. Ready? Yes. Actually, Laura, I'd actually like to invite you right back up. Uh, Laura was instrumental, uh, just a few words before you speak, Laura was instrumental in the, in the creation of this bust and in bringing it to Columbia. Uh, to say a few words, uh, uh, you know, to hear a few words from Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, granddaughter is really um, a very special occasion for us tonight. And um, I just want to say a few things about Laura, who's found success in multiple dimensions. She's an artist and a poet, a journalist, and a Yale MBA who um, managed J.P. Morgan's arts and culture philanthropic portfolio. So uh, really a, 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 a renaissance person within the arts and culture, and, uh, and we are just so pleased to have her with us here tonight. Uh, with that, Laura. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you all today, and I want to thank Bob Klitzman, my friend, and all of his colleagues at Columbia for making this happen. I also want to uh, give a nod to the Evelyn J. Sharp Foundation, which funded um, this cast of this bust and also its transportation here from the Czech Republic, which is where it was created. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to tell my story, uh, my version of Bob's story, which is that uh, about uh, last fall, we were at dinner at some mutual friend's house on Martha's Vineyard, which is where I live, and I um, told the story of what I'd been involved with, and it's because of that that we're all here today and that this bust is here today. <coughs> about A lot happens on Martha's Vineyard. About three months before that, I had a... a, a Bill Shipsey, whom Bob mentioned, who is an Irish human rights advocate, 
was also in Martha's Vineyard. We did not know each other, but we have a mutual friend. He was having lunch with that friend, and he told her that he had just commissioned a Czech sculptress to create this bust of Eleanor Roosevelt so that we could, he could place casts of it around the world in places to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he said, the thing is, I really wish that I could find a Roosevelt to partner with me on this project. <laughs> And our mutual friend said, well, it so happens that there's one of those right here. <laughs> so uh, since then, we have placed uh, busts, unveiled busts in, uh, as Bob said, in uh, Middleburg in the Netherlands near the Oldie Roosevelt homestead, in Slovenia, in, uh, in Paris, in the Palais de Chaillot, which is the building in which the UN ratified the declaration in 1948 and in a town in the Italian Dolomites called Auronzo, where the mayor renamed the central square the Piazza Eleanor Roosevelt. So human rights, like so many of the values that Mrs. Roosevelt championed, many well ahead of their time, must still be championed today. Slavery still exists, torture still exists, equal pay for equal work still does not exist, and rather than protecting families as the fundamental group units of society, many countries, including this one at our southern borders, tear families apart. There is not, in fact, a single one of the Declaration's 30 enumerated human rights that the world is universally observing. But let's not despair about how far we are from achieving the Declaration's goals. Let's think instead about the progress that we've made. In many countries, people are now free to marry whomever they choose, including people of other skin colors, other ethnicities, and people of the same gender. That's progress. While in many countries, uh, women are still paid less than men for equal work, the disparity in wages has narrowed, and that's progress. Women now can and do hold jobs that were effectively closed to them at the time that the Declaration was ratified. They are lawyers, doctors, bankers, secretaries of states, presidents of their countries, and that is progress. The Declaration was, as we all know, not a treaty. It was and remains a hopeful document, a guide for how we human beings should treat one another with mutual care, compassion, and respect. When it was passed, Uthant, who was then the Secretary General of the UN, called it the Magna Carta of humankind. Mankind, he said, but I like to say humankind. <clears throat> Although human rights abuses persist in our world, the fact that this declaration exists means that those abuses do not go unobserved. When President Truman named Eleanor Roosevelt as one of the members of the U.S. delegation to the United Nations, there were many who were not sure that she was an appropriate choice. Two Republican members of the delegation, uh, Senator Arthur Vandenberg and John Foster Dulles, implored Truman not to nominate the, quote, addle-brained Mrs. Roosevelt. She herself worried that she had insufficient experience and expertise in international affairs. But because she believed that the United Nations was, in her words, the one hope for a peaceful world, she accepted the job. When she arrived in London for her first UN session, she learned that she'd been assigned to the committee that dealt with humanitarian, social, and cultural affairs. She understood that she had been farmed out by her colleagues to somewhere that they considered relatively unimportant. In her autobiography, she notes that she was sure they were thinking, well, she can't do too much harm there. Little did any of them know that right away, her committee would start dealing with one of the hottest topics of the day. Refugees and displaced persons, post-war refugees and displaced person, persons, particularly Russians. At the time, Russia asserted that Russians who had fled during the war were traitors who should be forcibly repatriated to face the consequences. The US and others believed that refugees should be allowed to choose where they wished to live. The debate on this issue went on late into the night, with the Russians stalling for time, hoping that their opponents would go home exhausted before the issue came to a vote. Knowing that the numerous Latin American nations were generally in agreement with the US, Mrs. Roosevelt kept them from leaving by standing and speaking passionately and at length about Simon Bolivar and his stand for the freedom of Latin American people, 
The South American representatives, she wrote in her autobiography, stayed with us to the end, and when the vote was taken, we won. This was my grandmother's first victory in the UN, and it earned her the belated respect and approval of her fellow delegates. That night, returning after midnight to her hotel, she encountered John Foster Dulles and Senator Vandenberg. Mrs. Roosevelt, she reports that one of them said somewhat sheepishly, we must tell you that we did all we could to keep you off the United Nations delegation, but now we feel that we must acknowledge that we have worked with you gladly and found you good to work with, and we will be happy to do so again. Mrs. Roosevelt, who would eventually earn the nickname First Lady of the World, was off and running. Soon, Truman named her to the UN's Commission on Human Rights, of which she became chair, and as chair, she led the declaration to its ratification. There is nothing in my grandmother's early childhood to suggest that she would become the person she became. She was a serious, awkward child who lost, lost both of her parents before she was 10. She went to live with her maternal grandmother who teased her about her serious dis disposition by nicknaming her Granny and who raised her to be a debutante and a member of aristocratic society. That might well have been all that she became if she hadn't, at age 15, gone to boarding school in England where she found a mentor in its headmistress who was an active advocate for social responsibility and independence in young women. She had a profound effect on Eleanor who, when she finished school, returned to New York, made her debut at the Waldorf Astoria, and then promptly became involved in social reform work to the consternation of some of her family but she never stopped. My grandmother grew to have a fundamental compassion for all people, and she believed that mutual respect for the rights and freedoms of everyone was key to ensuring a peaceful and secure world. 10 years after the declaration was passed in a 1958 speech to the United Nations, probably around the time your stamp was issued, she summed up beautifully what it takes to make human rights a reality. Where, after all, she asked, do human rights begin in small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world, yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. This is why we are here now unveiling this bust of Eleanor Roosevelt. I am really glad to have it in New York City, where she was born, where she lived much of her life, and where she died. I'm delighted to have it at Columbia Law School, where FDR was a student at the time that he and Eleanor got married. Also, many of you may have read, there was an article in the New York Times last week that talked about the relative paucity of statues of women in this city. So I'm happy that we're doing our bit to rectify that situation. <laughs> now, when people walk past this statue, they will be reminded that in 1948, the world agreed that every person on the planet is entitled to certain inalienable human rights. We live in unsettling, troubling times. But we can take inspiration from the fact that someone like Eleanor Roosevelt, who was born into privilege, who was raised in a restrictive and not very loving environment, and who suffered tremendous personal loss at an early age, surmounted everything and devoted her life to making the world a better place for all human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for those uh, inspiring remarks. And, and thank you so much again for being here with us tonight. Uh, I'd now like to welcome the panelists to the stage and uh, to have you take your seats. And uh, I will also uh, introduce Roger Cohen, who will be the, the moderator of tonight's panel. Uh, so uh, over the course uh, of Roger's 40 plus year career, he's focused the world's attention on pressing issues related to the protection of democracy and democratic institutions, uh, the international rule of law, and human rights. 
At the Times, for the past 29 years, Roger has been a foreign correspondent, uh, a foreign editor, and now a columnist. He's reported from all over the U.S. and the world and is uh, widely recognized as a leading journalist of his time. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome him uh, and our distinguished panelists tonight, uh, whom he will introduce. And uh, so with that, I will, uh, well, I will cede the podium to Roger and, uh, and thank him again for being our, our tonight's moderator. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, th thank you very much, Gillian. Thank you, Laura, for those inspiring remarks. Um, it's um, a great honor to be here tonight. Um, as Gillian said, I'm a columnist for The Times, uh, enemy of the people <laughs> for <laughs> President Trump, a phrase of pure totalitarian pedigree. Um, on this 70th anniversary, there are many uh, troubling developments for supporters of human rights uh, around the world, and I'm referring particularly to the nationalist, nativist, xenophobic wave um, unfurling across the globe, which unfortunately I do not think has yet reached its zenith. Um, I'm delighted to introduce this briefly, this very distinguished panel. Um, to my left here is Alida Black who's a history professor at George Washington University and advisory board chair of the Eleanor Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt Papers Project. Um, then uh, next over is Tracy Robinson, who is a senior lecturer at the University of the West Indies and former president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Lynn Friedman, is Professor and Director Averting Maternal Death and Disability Project, Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. Um, then Sarah Cleveland, uh, who is the Lewis Henkin Professor of Human and Constitutional Rights here at Columbia Law School and former, chair, former Vice Chair of the UN Human Rights Committee uh, in Geneva. Uh, and finally, hiding from me, um, way over there, uh, is K.M. Ahmed, uh, who's a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School and former chief executive officer, um, South African Human Rights Commission. Um, Alida, I'll, I'll start with you, if I may. Um, if First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt were sitting with us here um, up on the stage reviewing uh, what has happened over the past seven decades. Uh, how do you think uh, she would assess the performance, uh, the impact of the Universal De Declaration on Human Rights as, as a success or not? I think so. She would see it definitely through the lens of evidence for hope. And I would say that with a friendly amendment, if I might, to... Um, Laura's quote because it's frequently misquoted. And the most important sentence is the last sentence, which people feel is too political to include. And it says, without concerted citizen rights, citizen, I'm sorry, without concerted citizen action, they will disappear. And what does she mean by that? I would like to tweak your image of Eleanor Roosevelt in order to answer your question, and I swear I'll do it briefly. Um, Please go ahead. This woman was the most hated woman in the United States. She was the most admired and the most hated. The American Bar Association thought she was a communist. The American Bar Association opposed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The person that had to debate the American Bar Association was Eleanor Roosevelt, who had four years of school. I'm not talking college or postdoctorate or graduate school. I'm talking totally self-taught. There were 17 assassination attempts on her life. This was rough work. And nobody on the American delegation really wanted her to do it. And so in order to really understand Eleanor's contribution to the Declaration, 
You need to see her as a shrewd political warrior who risked her income, her reputation, her physical safety, her column circulation to, in fact, keep people together. And one of the reasons that I think that she would see hope today is despite the politics of fear that seem to overwhelm us and give us, in my opinion, a cop-out. Well, the preamble speaks of freedom from yeah, fear. Yeah, exactly. We don't seem to have achieved that. We haven't. But, but I want you to look at who's speaking out. I want you to look at Parkland. I want you to look at the kids in South Africa. I want you to look at the president of Slovenia. Do we think it's a perfect world? No. But the world now is stratospherically different in terms of levels of combat, income inequality, gender discrimination, family recognitions, despite our Neolithic president, the right to travel. So Eleanor would say the glass is half full rather than half empty, but we will drink it by, dry if we do not risk ourselves. Tracy, uh, glass half full. Um, from your perspective, um, looking particularly at the Caribbean and Central American countries where there are very high levels of violence, um, do some of what the stipulations in uh, the clauses in the Universal Declaration seem to you like pious hopes that haven't really been realized. I mean, when you have societies that are really violent, that are marginalizing people, where people often have no basic rights. I was recently in Guatemala. Um, what, would you, what would you say to these people uh, about the relevance of the Declaration? Well, I think the first thing is that um, 70 years later, those countries are part of the world community, um, that significantly a much larger group of states are part of the conversation about human rights and its evolution. And I think there is a conundrum for countries like mine in which there are high rates of violence and it's a conundrum in which it seems as if the protection of human rights are often viewed as inimical to the security of the state. Um, you know, those top 20 countries of which a large proportion are Latin American. Inimical to the interests of the state. Why? Because it somehow intrudes on the sovereignty of the state? Um, no, not in, in, in the sense that the question of security mm -hmm. and the extraordinary measures that states are taking now to address security, you know, where the exception has become the norm, uh, where exceptional measures are now ordinary. You know, a couple of weeks ago in Jamaica, the vast majority, over 90% of Jamaicans said that they would prefer states of emergency to address high crime. And, but we also know that with those emergencies come restrictions on rights which are in some respects intolerable. And so you have this conundrum in which uh, the thing which is valued and which we also connect to human rights, which is the security of the person, the body, the self, um, our intention with the kind of historic rights which we've associated with liberty, uh, due process, um, the right to life. Uh, and I think human rights may not have the answer to the problem of crime, but it certainly has to be instructive in thinking about the methods for addressing crime. Um, you know, the accountability of state authorities and police, the conversations you're having in this country as well. Um, very, very important, the participation of ordinary people in the development of crime policies, and critically to the extent that human insecurity in Latin America and the Caribbean are connected to the failure to realize social and economic rights for the poorest and the worst off, um, then the human rights discussion is critical to the ongoing conversation about crime. Uh, Lynn, after the declaration um, was approved, um, there were there were two treaties. Um, one dealt with the civil and political side and one dealt with the economic and social. Um, looking at this from your perspective as somebody very involved in health issues around the world, do you think that division which, which kind of hived off civil and political rights from 
um, from economic and social rights like the right to health care. Uh, do you think that split uh, was unhelpful? I, I certainly think it was unhelpful. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think... Um, it dissociated know, the two parts of the right, declaration, right. really. Yeah. I think in, in public health, when we talk about a right to health, the, the fundamental thing that it enables us to see is the way in, with, in which patterns of health are always deeply political. So when you look across a population at how health is patterned, it's always political. So here's a social issue that is a fundamentally political issue. Um, in addition, um, the, the other idea that um, you have a right to something, for example, in my field, they always talk about the right to access contraception Right, or the right to decide about the number and spacing of children. Which but the United States government is not exactly helping with these days. No, it's certainly not. Um, but but the, the key factor is whether you have the means to implement that right, to exercise that right. So simply having a political right without the means... Uh, if you're starving, it's not much use being free. Or having a right, yeah, exactly. So I would say it's been very unhelpful, and the uh, the effort to bring it together in the 1990s, I think, really enabled the field of health and human rights to take off. It was only after the Cold War was over, and the two came together as uh, with a recognition that they were interdependent that the field actually took off. Uh, Sarah, um, uh, as a journalist, as an American, and I'm sure I'm expressing the sentiments of many people here, when Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post columnist, was murdered uh, in his consulate uh, in Istanbul, um, there was really a pretty mild or non-existent uh, US uh, reaction. Um, and this was pretty much consistent with the nod and a wink to authoritarian governments and individuals around the world that we've seen from the Trump administration. So would you say that um, with this administration, America's defense of human rights around the world uh, has um, partially or completely vanished? Well, I'm a human rights lawyer, and the glass is always half full, right? So I would say partially rather than completely vanished. But no, I think that the, the lesson from the Universal Declaration and Eleanor Roosevelt's role in it is that the United States, while being one country among many, nevertheless has played a very, very profound and foundational role um, in the creation and uh, promotion of the human rights system. That's not to say that we have a perfect human rights record by any means, but there are core human rights that are very, very deeply instilled in the American value system, including protecting freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. And, and we're not only seeing those um, not defended internationally, but even trashed internationally. And so when uh, the President of the United States not only uh, doesn't condemn acts like the Khashoggi murder in any meaningful way, but indeed embraces repeatedly the country that perpetuated it, um, that perpetrated it, it, it simply sends a message to authoritarian regimes everywhere, Guatemala you just mentioned being uh, one of them, that, that it's uh, open season on human rights in their countries, and that's extremely disturbing. You were the deputy chair of the UN Human Rights Committee in Geneva until recently. Um, how did you find the United States being viewed there in light of what you've just described? Well, interestingly, the U.S. has always had a member on the U.N. Human Rights Committee. Lou Henkin uh, was also uh, the U.S. member on the Human Rights Committee. 
Uh, so that has shown a U.S. commitment to the treaty bodies and uh, to supporting the U.N. human rights mechanisms. But that said, the U.S. has also had a, a fairly lengthy um, hostility towards at least some of the interpretations of treaty bodies like the Human Rights Committee, and these are longstanding and familiar. So the U.S. has taken the position that the ICCPR does not apply extraterritorially, it has taken a very narrow interpretation of various rights uh, protected by the covenant. Uh, we were drafting a new declaration, well, a new general comment on the right to life, which merged, uh, I think, traditional civil and political and economic social conceptions of uh, the building blocks that are necessary to protect and preserve and promote life. Uh, and the U.S. comments that were submitted to the Human Rights Committee were essentially ignored mm -hmm. on the committee. The, uh, the, the comments from the U.K., from France, from Canada, from Australia were all taken seriously and had an impact on the drafting. The U.S. comments were, did not. KM, uh, you've been very patient. Um, um, do you think 70 years on that... Um, that anything should be added or taken away uh, from the Universal Declaration? Should we add something to those 30, I think it is, clauses? Um, or yeah. is it just right as it is? I probably, you know how at every birthday party, everyone is meant to go around the room and say something nice and kind about the person whose birthday we are celebrating? But there's inevitably one guest who's had too much to drink, um, and so they speak their mind a little inebriated. I feel like I'm going to be that guest uh, this evening, and and I do go think right ahead. <laughs> I do think your question is an important one. Um, for instance, if we examine the UDHR, and particularly at the time in which it was developed, there is no mention whatsoever of colonialism, for instance, and colonialism has continued to impact and affect the way in which the Global South, in particular, has developed or has not developed. And so questions must be asked about whether the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the human rights framework that emerged from that could potentially be seen as a fairly white, liberal, Euro-American, patriarchal discourse that reinforces colonial discourses that were present at the time the UDHR was developed. And so I want to put that... Oh, several people, notably from the Islamic world, have done that over the decades since at various times, I think. Right. Sure, absolutely. And uh, Saudi Arabia is probably an incredibly good example of that, who also served, by the way, on the... Probably the in a pretty rights negative rights. way, I would say. Indeed. Uh, but they are, uh, the question is, should the UDHR be relevant 70 years later... I'm not sure, I'm, I, I'm fully convinced that Eleanor Roosevelt would be as celebratory of the Universal Decla Declaration. She's a, she was a radical of her time. And I feel as if uh, human rights have been appropriated um, to the extent that they've lost their radicality. And so my Wait, position... What element of radicality? I think the element of radicality around the question, uh, well, at the time, as a woman, Firstly, in that hostile space and environment that you've spoken of uh, to develop this idea and to cultivate this idea, I think is a radical in and of itself. Her being marginalized and pushed to the edges is certainly a radical act. Today, it's become so mainstream that it has lost its essence and radicality. And I do think perhaps a new way of looking at human rights may be required. Um, one of the things I've been engaged with is questioning whether the idea of the human in human rights is a sufficient construct to contain all of the kinds of humans we have. You'll notice that the language is very male-dominated in the UDHR. Subsequently, women were added. What about queer people, transgender folks, black people, who were not necessarily thought of um, front and center in the construction of this document? So potentially, my argument is, as the inebriated guest at this party... So, so should the right to choose your gender be added? I think that there's a lot more things that need to be added. Right to choose your gender, sure, so the rights of transgender folks. But in the age of climate change and in the age of artificial intelligence and the idea of transhumanism, 
I would go even one step further. I'm calling what is transhumanism. For, oh, transhumanism is I, this idea that human bodies and technology should begin to merge in order to uh, have the human species evolve. And so I want to question whether this idea of human um, is a sufficient basis for us to think about. In digital beings should have rights. And in fact, this is what cyborgs, and believe it or not, there is a cyborg bill of rights, has actually been pushing for. So I think these are the questions that the UDHR can't quite deal with, that the human, as conceived in the UDHR's construction, has not evolved uh, with where we are technologically, and recognizing that the construction of the human is a deeply anthropocentric one that centers the human but ignores nature and the environment. And given everything that's going on with climate change, I do think a delinking of the human from human rights is potentially an area that we need to move toward. Do any of you have any thoughts on that? There's quite a lot of provocative I, material there. Yeah. I, could I just, yeah, could I respond first? Um, I would profoundly disagree with you about um, the Latin like colonial. Um, um, I wish I could take credit for this because I certainly read every document that's related in the history of the human world to the creation of the Declaration. But Catherine Sickink has a marvelous book that is exceedingly well documented that talks about the role that um, anti-colonial leaders, especially um, in the Global South, played a huge role in it. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was very involved early on in anti-colonial movements. In fact, the last conversation she had in the White House prior to learning of FDR's death was working with Charles Tostig on how to circumvent the War Council on setting up a new UN trusteeship slash mandate, let's get rid of both policies. So that's a, I, w I would argue with that. Um, I also would say that I look at the negotiation of the Declaration as, as a monumental achievement, not in a unified pie in the sky way, but I just want you to think about 18 nations sitting around a table. They don't agree on anything. They don't agree on the right to marriage. They don't agree on who a person is. They don't agree if a child is an infant or an adult. They don't agree on whether God exists. They don't agree on the purpose of government. They don't agree on what citizenship means. They don't agree on anything except one thing, and that is, by God, they beat the Germans. I'm serious, and if you read all of the debates, and if you read all of the personal correspondence that goes on between all the members of the delegation, it is a search for a common core. And whether that common core is flawed or not. Do you think there's a lesson there for our politics? Absolutely, I believe that there's a lesson there. And that's why I go around the world, no longer at GW, but running human rights education workshops for people who list their lives in the field. Liberia, Ghana, South Africa, Venezuela, Argentina, Kosovo. The people on the ground want something to say, this is what I can believe in and risk my life. And so is the declaration flawed in terms of its 30 articles? I mean, there are better legal minds than me for that. But in terms of giving people the courage in the absence of everything that can give them a reason to believe that life can get better, it is sacrosanct in my book. Thank you. Um, Sarah, you wanted to say something, I think, and then Lynn also wanted to say something, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think that, I mean, one thing that should be understood is that in the drafting of the Declaration, extensive efforts were made to draw common uh, human rights standards from legal traditions, religious traditions, philosophical traditions, all over the world, and there were multiple layers of this process that fed into the drafting of the Universal Declaration. No one anywhere in the world wants to be arbitrarily detained. No one wants to be arbitrarily killed. No one wants to be tortured. Everyone wants to be able to eat. These are common standards. 
that said, it is also clearly true, and Kaim is uh, certainly right, that the understanding of human rights uh, at the time of the drafting of the Declaration and as uh, we went forward with the Covenants was a quite constrained one. Um, and the Declaration has language that was sufficiently open that it has been adapted, I think, over time to recognize rights of women in the private sphere, now rights of the LGBTQI community, uh, to recognize the relationship among different rights um, and so on and so forth. But this has required effort and this has required radical movement after radical movement to help uh, achieve the recognition of, of other rights. Lynn? Yeah, I would basically agree. The fact that some people, some issues were left out of the declaration in 1948 has not prevented the fundamental ideas and values of it from being used by precisely some of those groups, nor has it prevented it from being actually used on the ground, I think, as a extremely radical uh, position in many settings. Um, there are places, including right here in New York City, honestly, um, that people see the ability to um, invoke the UDHR and human rights and the basic principles as the fundamental um, building blocks of the movements, the concerted citizens' rights that she was talking about, that they use to defend their very lives. Tracy, there's, um, there's kind of a counter movement to that, which we've seen uh, from Moscow to the Philippines to Brazil uh, and elsewhere where the word human rights or the phrase human rights has become a kind of code for, well not even a code, just a description of um, the liberal multilateralists who are trying to break down our sovereignty in the name of some elite liberal order and basically subvert our sovereign greatness and there are some echoes in this country which you may be recognizing. Um, and, uh, and really using the phrase human rights um, in a very, very negative political way. Um, what do you think about that? Why is that happening? Why has it happened? Well, I don't think it's new, um, nor is it isolated. Perhaps new in intensity. Um, and then also, you know, new depending on where you are yeah. and the register in which you hear it at a given moment. Um, you know, part of it connects to the larger discussion about the universality of human rights, um, which is a continuing conversation. Uh, you know, but I think what you see in these shifts and moves are not necessarily things which are stable. Um, you're here in a, a dynamic space in which the debate and the conversation is ongoing, um, but not necessarily one in which there's been a dramatic and radical shift. And when you look on the ground in countries throughout the world, the language of human rights, um, the work of human rights, uh, the, the work through constitutions which articulate norms which build on the Universal Declaration over the last 70 years, you are hearing considerable um, interest in asserting and seeking protection and respect. So yes, there are high registers of conversations um, which challenge and question and which have very, very strong rhetoric. Um, but it's not clear that all throughout the world this is a dominant theme um, or that the systems of human rights, regional and national and global, don't continue to make a significant impact. In the, in the protection of rights throughout so the world. So you're optimistic overall? I'm, I'm optimistic in the sense that backlash and shifts will always happen. Yeah. Um, but I do take the word about what the message is about the ongoing activism um, in reclaiming the language of human rights and social justice and whatever terminology each of us uses in different parts of the world to articulate 
that goal we have about human e equality, um, I do see not resurgence, but still very strong support and anchoring for those ideas throughout the world. I mean, sometimes I think about having covered the war in Bosnia uh, and the genocide there, which I did, and, and, and after that, and, and Kosovo, there was kind of a high watermark of um, the idea of a responsibility to protect, and that universalism, universal human rights, um, superseded sovereignty and were more important and a great deal of energy at the United Nations went into trying to formulate a R2P um, charter. Um, you know, that today just seems quaint um, to me. I mean, I, 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 I'm not happy to say that, but I feel that the world's gone backward from that and that sovereignty, nationalism, nativism, uh, xenophobia, are on the rise. Right. Well, you yeah. know, I, th I think you can look at it as an entire globe, and you can look at sure. the, the micro spaces. And I think of my world, in which 25 years ago, my countries like my own um, determined that they would no longer send individual petitions to the Human Rights Committee over a debate about the death penalty. Um, many Caribbean countries responded extremely negatively um, to the position of international human rights bodies about their use of the death penalty. Today, it's been since 2008, in my own country, 30 years since anyone's been executed. The United States is the only executing country in the entire hemisphere. Um, and no one thinks the death penalty is an answer or a useful solution or an appropriate one. That shift happened in two decades. That's the small space in which a significant shift has happened and continues. It doesn't register on the global lands landscape, but it nevertheless is important, and there are many of those small stories throughout the world which in Th aggregate Thank matter. you for reminding us of that. Sarah, how worried are you by this apparent shift um, where you see the European Union uh, Britain's madness um, and uh, a sort of wave of uh, nationalism. Um. I mean, I think we're seeing a challenge to the institutions that were created to establish peace and protect rights after the Second World War in a way that we've never seen before. It's a fundamental challenge. We thought we had moved the other direction with the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, and now the, now the tide is shifting back again. How far back it will shift, how far it will take us, I think uh, is not clear. I, I, I definitely agree that um, the world swings as a pendulum in this space, and certainly I'm not ready to give up hope now on the human rights system, but there is a challenge facing the human rights system, and the willingness of states, friendly states like the UK, like the U.S., uh, to support the human rights system um, that we have not seen and is very worrying. Um, I'm going to throw this open in a few minutes, so if, if any of you have any questions, uh, please start formulating them or thinking about them, um, uh, because I'd like for the last 15 or 20 minutes just to let you all um, have your say. Um, Kayam, I... I share some South African background with you. My parents were both born in Johannesburg. Um, and you know, in South Africa, the, the Constitutional Court and the defense of human rights, most notably through the recent very corrupt um, presidency of Zuma, and also, of course, in the whole transition uh, from apartheid, played a very, uh, and continues to play, a very central and important role. Could you talk about that a little? Um, uh, how, just how important human rights, its defense by the Constitutional Court in South Africa have been? Sure, and I think it in fact connects to a lot of the points that were being made earlier. So South Africa, for those who don't know, adopted probably one of the most progressive human rights-based constitutions in 1996 that protects both civil and political and socioeconomic rights. So the right to housing, water, food, health and education are entrenched um, in the Constitution. Interestingly enough, what's happened recently is, and I, I study 
social movements that are emerging in South Africa, uh, a movement that's centered on this idea of fallism, which started very much around a statue, uh, interestingly enough, of Cecil John Rhodes, a colonialist whose statue was placed at the center of the University of Cape Town. These fallists who I've spent many uh, months with in South Africa and then subsequently at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom where a Rhodes must fall Oxford movement was started, they have distanced themselves from this idea of human rights. Radical students uh, in South Africa, in the UK, and even here in the United States where I have worked with um, uh, movements on Columbia's campus uh, working to combat um, fascists and racists who have been invited onto campus to speak, these student movements do not employ a human rights discourse in their engagement with what's happening globally um, uh, and this move towards fascism and, and the right. What they are arguing for instead is a more decolonial discourse, and I think this is something that is a lot more radical. Probably, I would argue, that Eleanor Roosevelt would probably be more inclined towards, given the day and age that we find ourselves in. And so what's interesting is states, and I, I think the analysis is problematic. Your analysis is that states are moving away from human rights towards authoritarianism and uh, right-wing uh, thinking. I think states have actually embraced human rights discourses, and particularly those right-wing states, have begun to recognize that by speaking the language of human rights, you are less uh, scrutinized by the international system. Um, and so states have actually begun appropriating those rights discourses um, into what I refer to as human rights as sovereignty. In fact, they use human rights as a way of reinforcing sovereignty, is, is my argument. So, radical student Could you give an example? So I mean, they use it as a mask, as a... As a they use it as a mask. Um, so a good example would probably be a place like Rwanda, where the government has very much adopted this idea of human rights. Women make up 50% uh, or, or more now of parliament, but it's an incredibly authoritarian regime. Israel is another example. Saudi Arabia is another example. There are, Mexico has done this as well on a couple of occasions, where they use the language of human rights to actually suppress and oppress, um, in Mexico, for instance, indigenous communities. Um, so the right to property, for instance, is used as a way of denying indigenous people the right to land. Uh, so I do think that there's actually a shift towards human rights that's been appropriated by uh, right-wing governments, and that the counter uh, argument is actually to move away from rights discourse. So young students that I'm engaging with and that I work with are more likely to adopt a decolonial framework. And to give you one final example, right here at Columbia University. So, uh, uh, sorry, decolonial yes. framework. I mean, concretely, what does that mean? So in South Africa, uh, it's a And also, I mean, yes. what you've described is just consistent with the doublespeak of our age, where words become weightless and meaningless and... Uh, Fair enough. That's a, that's a valid critique, and I think yeah. within, the, within the student movement, this is certainly something that's happened. So more specifically and concretely in South Africa, the decolonial framework comprises of three dimensions, which is black consciousness, Steve Biko's idea of black consciousness, pan-Africanism, and black radical feminism. So queer transgender folks are often taking the lead in these movements. Um, in the United States, in the context of Columbia University, um, the Republican student uh, organization here invited a white supremacist to come and speak on campus. This person, by the way, refers to their organization as a human rights organization. So right-wing organizations have also appropriated this discourse. And therefore the question becomes, is human rights necessarily a valid framework for us to take forward, uh, or should we be thinking of alternative frameworks at this point? Okay, on that provocative note, um, <laughs> Uh, I would like to throw this open. Um, yes, Matt. Yeah. I don't know if I should use this or not. I'm used to using it in class. Um, so I want to first thank you for um, honesty and enthusiasm and you know all the different perspectives. Um, my question is actually more about what maybe Eleanor Roosevelt would say about the role of the first lady in terms of working on behalf of the people because you know right now we see Melania she is frequently out of the country shopping getting spa treatments she doesn't seem to stand for anything and I don't see a lot of discourse about you know holding her accountable um, what she ought to be doing whatever happened to the bullying campaign um, so yeah I, if, if there are any thoughts about that I'd, I'd love to hear <laughs> 
Uh, I'll take a, a quick stab at it. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt did not want to be first lady. She, the night FDR wins the election, oh, sorry. Um, am I on? Yeah. Um, Eleanor did not want to be first lady. The night FDR wins, you know, she tells Lorena Hickok in a quote for the record for the nationally syndicated column that she didn't want to be first lady so much. She was considering divorcing FDR because she'd seen what the White House did to women. It ate women. And she did not want to be confined to a life of white gloves and tees. And so there was an extraordinary conversation between the two of them that negotiates that. She would say two things. She would say it's up to the woman to define the position. And she tried very hard to drag Bess Truman into doing what Eleanor wanted to do. In fact, Bess writes Harry about the bruises that she gets on her wrist from the, you know, from the clutch. But, you know, she would bemoan her aloofness and her politics, but not bemoan that she was not taking an active political role. She felt very much women should make that own choice. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I had a, I See, I, I was just curious about the relationship between human rights and inequality, how important it is for the right uh, for people to participate as equals in civil society. Uh, consider like a, the, the equal ability to influence elections, for example. I mean, often we talk about basic human rights in developing nations for protections against starving, squalor, disease, and arbitrary violence. But in advanced nations, we have found you know, economic growth can peak where progress for the public good starts to decrease, where excess of greed economic segregation, elitist scorn for less successful people, and endless stress, despair, and worry cause problems that are those human right issues. Thank you very much. Uh, Lynn, would you like to take that? Perhaps? <laughs> yeah, I think those are definitely human rights issues, and I think, um, you know, around the world, um, human rights issues have been used to really challenge, for example, in the health setting, the deep disparities we, we see in, in health, um, and, and to um, recognize health systems essentially as social institutions where people have a right to participate, to be part of decision-making about different aspects of their lives and the way that system works. Um, and I think this is all, in a sense, very separate from the form of human rights system. Um, so I think in a field like public health, um, people have just sort of put to the side the kind of formal discourse about human rights and tried to take that principles like inequality and make them meaningful at a very basic level in, uh, in the places they live. And so this whole question of the misuse of human rights discourse by development agencies or by the governments they live in, um, I think is often really challenged by people on the ground who um, are not willing to accept the kinds of disparities that they see. And, and let me just say, that includes right here in New York City. I mean, I work in the area of maternal mortality. Black women in New York City have 12 times higher maternal mortality rate than white women. 12 times? 12 times in this city. And the, the you know, women of color-led reproductive justice movement specifically draws on human rights ideas to try to challenge that and is not saying, you know, we have to go uh, through a formal legal, is not looking at formal law or formal human rights, but is using ideas of human rights uh, to demand an intersectional analysis, to demand that racism be called out as a cause of that kind of disparity, and so on. So I see it as a very valuable way to talk about inequality even as it's uh, being misused in all of the ways you describe, which 
I quite agree with. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. Hello. Back. All right. Thank you all so much for uh, for being here this evening. Um, I want to uh, also particularly thank Professor Ahmed for the work that you've done with students on campus. I'm a student at Columbia College, so I appreciate the fact that you are putting, uh, you know, you're walking the walk and talking the talk as well. So I appreciate that. Um, my question is also to you as well. Um, I'm interested in thinking about um, the UDHR. Something that stands out to me is that the United Nations is sort of has this implicit uh, importance on states, right? The existence of states with boundaries and borders um, that, you know, uh, in some ways generate the rights, that the rights come from the states themselves to the people. Thinking about the ways in which, um, in the very near future, um, you know, the ways in which climate change um, uh, and climate collapse uh, will affect boundaries and borders. Um, I'd be curious about um, your thoughts on how the international sort of human rights uh, community might be able to adjust and think critically about the ways in which this framework might need to adjust uh, towards a changing planet. Thank you so much. I think that's an excellent question, a very timely one. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think one of the challenges with human rights discourses is its deep uh, focus on the human um, and fails to, for instance, take into account indigenous thinking which connects the human to nature. And what we've done using a very Euro-American individualistic approach to rights discourse is to separate the human from nature. And so we focus very intently on the human. And this anthropocentricism, I think, has contributed in some ways to us forgetting about the impact that human beings have on climate. And so potentially, it's a move towards uh, the past rather than towards the future and in introducing indigenous uh, thinking into human rights discourses that may in fact give it life um, and may in fact allow it to become a framework that, that takes very seriously the impact um, of climate change. So that may be one option. Another perhaps more radical option is to, and, and the fallist movement would probably argue for this, is a complete dismantling of the existing system um, and trying to build something from scratch. What that would look like, of course, there's a large question mark about that, but there have been arguments that uh, tinkering with the system, adjusting it here and there, um, may in fact continue to perpetuate some of the inequalities that were inherent at the very start of the system. So one option may be... How, how do you dismantle a system? Uh, uh, I mean, just... <laughs> Yes. So uh, the work that Seven I've been... Seven billion people, sure. uh, lots uh, of it, different it, forms of society. Absolutely. Uh, and, it, and it one just, way, I can't get my head around it. I know. I know. And it's very hard for me to get my head around. But one of the things that we often do um, is to use that as an excuse to, f to not engage in a question about dismantling the system. I think we could possibly start right here at Columbia University, at Columbia Law School, and I've made this point a number of times, how this very institution which promotes and protects human rights and teaches us, and I'm one of those teachers here, who teaches us about human rights discourses, is part of a problem of gentrifying black people in the surrounding neighborhoods. So how does our expansion as an institution push aside those on the margins, while at the same time we sit with this paradoxical position of teaching students how to defend those very margins. So perhaps the decolonial thinking should start right here, and then we can talk about the borders and all of these other challenges. But I think breaking it down into pieces that we can actually engage. You're talking about the gentrification of this part of New York? Or sure, that, yeah. but also the, the problems raised by my colleague here about health disparities. Education is another issue in, in New York where it's the most segregated education system, I believe, in the United States. So uh, equality between black and white is one thing, but um, when that equal system leads to black bodies being completely marginalized by the education system, ghetto-wise, in some ways like the apartheid system in South Africa has done, it raises questions about how these frameworks are in fact perpetuating rather than helping to alleviate the challenges we currently face. I'd like to see you, Cam, after a couple of drinks. That'll <laughs> <laughs> um, at the back there, please. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Anjali, and I'm a legal fellow here at the Human Rights Institute, and I'm also from Kenya. My question is um, about who really controls the human rights agenda. Um, today we've spoken a lot about how the UDHR is a document used to inspire people at the margins or people at the grassroots. But 
within the human rights field as a whole, funding uh, the agenda decisions proposals about which rights matter are largely developed and controlled in the West. Grassroots organizations receive very little funding. Um, as you mentioned, the development agenda has looked at trying to critique inward, but to what extent is the human rights field itself perpetuating the same um, problems that it's seeking to solve? And to what extent is there a need for, for there to be a radical rethink in whether the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other human rights agendas are actually serving the people that they're trying to or claiming to serve? Sarah and Tracy, perhaps both of you could, could go at that from um, your perspective. Sarah, do you want to start and then, yeah. Sure, um, and Anjali, I remember you're asking this in human rights, so this is all very familiar. No, I think, I think it's an extremely important critique of uh, civil society engagement um, in the human rights system. On, you know, it is a tragic reality that the, the first world is where the resources are um, and where the skill sets are and uh, where easy access is. Um, I mean, the, the Human Rights Committee sits in Geneva, right? Um, for civil society groups from small countries in the global south to send representatives to actually be physically present at a session of the Human Rights Committee is essentially impossible. Notoriously cheap town as well. Notoriously right? cheap town, yes. Uh, you know, so the, the whole system, I mean, one thing we actually talked about was having um, roving sessions take the Human Rights Committee to the region rather than make the region come. And, and this, this could create options for accessibility. But I think, um, I think it's an extremely important point. Another thing, you know, webcasting technology, um, then you have to have ac access to technology on both sides. But it can at least uh, open up some of these spaces uh, to more voices. That said, um, in the in the work of the Human Rights Committee, we got some really quite extraordinary input from local uh, human rights advocacy groups that were um, dedicated to their cause and provided very invaluable information to the committee. Tracy? You know, one of the, in the, in the Caribbean, a group of us as teachers in the university have been working on LGBT issues for the last 10 years. And um, we've almost never had to look for funding. Um, and that's because donors have a very strong interest in the Caribbean as a space which is viewed as homophobic. Um, but we've noticed on other issues uh, that it's challenging to find resources. And so I think ethically we have been thinking about those who have resources, how do we build coalitions with others with less? How do we do work with little? And how do we say to donors, we're moving on? as we sometimes have from the issues you consider most important to the ones which we see as pressing. And how do we use the spaces of privilege which we have, which universities often are, um, to help to move other agendas forward, even in the face of those who have strong interest in very specific issues, partly because of the way in which they understand where the rest of us are in the global south. Um, and so, I think we challenge those impressions, the setting of the agenda elsewhere, in how we do our work and what we do with the little which we have. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. The fact that the uh, language of human rights has been appropriated or misappropriated by others, right? is reminiscent of a famous adage that hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. In other words, there's something powerful about those ideas that even those who want to violate them would like to pretend that they're following them. So, but on a more practical level, so I, I, I mean, I think it's encouraging in a, fun, in a weird way that that's what they choose to, uh, uh, as opposed to just saying, well, that's just Western imperial colonial thinking and we don't have anything to do with it. But um, of course, there are people who very eloquently try to show that there are seeds of human rights ideas from all around the world, other cultures as well. And of course, Western culture has had fascists and Nazis and, uh, and the Inquisition and so forth. It's not as though Western culture is just all about uh, what Eleanor Rosa was valiantly uh, advocating. So um, my practical question is, which of these aspirations, a lot of it is very aspirational, 
do you think have, can come, and maybe even have to come, from the power of these ideas within each uh, society? And which of these ideas really needs a kind of cooperation um, and uh, you know, collaboration, uh, which we don't necessarily always see. For example, this right to asylum, it's, of course, obviously not every refugee seeking asylum can go to one country, right? It seems like all the countries that have goodwill should be cooperating with each other to try to figure out how to give true refuge to the people who, who are truly, you know, victims of persecution. So, but where do you see the best cooperation happening where it's needed, and where do you see the most prom promising um, uh, progressive movement from within societies. I think some, there have been some references to some of those developments. Who would like to take that? <laughs> okay, St Sarah, step into the breach. <laughs> so when you were asking the question, well first I have to say that um, our beloved Lewis Henkin had a, a similar observation about hypocrisy in the human rights system and he said that hypocrisy um, hypocrisy on the part of states with respect to human rights was a sign of progress mm -hmm. because when he started in human rights, states didn't feel the need to lie about their human rights record. <laughs> you know, so at least, at least it's gone underground, right? Um, when you were asking the question, I was thinking about asylum as an obvious uh, place where people are moving cross, across borders and, I mean, the European refugee flows have, have been a very... Uh, poignant example of the need for cooperation with respect to distribution of responsibility. Um, you know, the, the issue that Roger raised earlier of responsibility to protect in situations of gross human rights violations in a particular country, uh, that's, a, that's a responsibility for the entire international community to, to come together and find ways to address it. And I also think that um, places where rights involve commitments of substantial resources in order to protect them, which can include economic and social rights, but doesn't necessarily, I mean, is not necessarily limited to that. Um, obviously, uh, the distribution of wealth, the, the, um, the grossly unequal distribution of wealth in the world uh, means that some countries don't have the means to, to achieve those rights on their own. Okay, I think we have, to, well, we don't really have time, but I'll take one last question if, if there is one. Uh, otherwise, I'll, yes. Hi, um, thanks uh, for being here. Um, I'm a student from Germany, and um, I have a question, like a very general question. I, um, how can human rights ever be achieved completely in a world where privilege rules? Um, for instance, especially in local in the local de department, for example, in schools, um, or um, yeah, because sometimes you feel like human rights are a farce because the world seems to watch. Where um, in the world, very bad things happened. Take as an example the refugee crisis at the moment, or um, the Palestine. Um, crisis that is happening at the moment. Yeah, that's, thank you. And we also live at a time of vastly growing income inequality. Um, Alida, I started with you, maybe we should end with you. What, is, is human rights just um, a farce, as it was just described? Uh, In the light of these injustices that we see all around us? No, um, I hope that's clear. Uh, I, am, um, I am not a lawyer. I um, have worked in systems, but no, I have flitted in and out of systems to try to advocate for support for systems within different communities. And I work on the ground with people who risk their lives every day, who may or may not be part of another organization. And so while I realize that we are talking about human rights in the rule of law and the international systems that were designed to uphold and now often um, abuse or cap, you know, capture, redefine their, um, their power, I think there is no more powerful tool on the face of the earth 
than an individual realizing in their mind and in their gut what this means and the courage that it gives them to risk it. I want you to look at the Liberian women who stopped the 17-year civil war, which made Iraq look like a sandbox. You know, I want you to look at what it took for Ellen Johnson's relief to run and stand up in that country. I want you to look at the change in the United States. You know, yes, we are becoming um, a country where it is more uh, fashionable to speak out like an idiot, you know. But we are also a country of very brave young people. And for every Trump, I want you to look at Emma Gonzalez. And then I want you to tell me that human rights are dead. On that note, um, <laughs> um, thank, thank you all. Thank you to all the members of the panel. I must say, as I, I looked down the line here, I, I kept expecting Eleanor Roosevelt to start speaking. <laughs> and I certainly felt her ideas, her conviction, her determination, her passion very present here tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>